Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Gold. I'm the Associate Dean of International and Area Studies and the Director of the Berkeley China Initiative. I'd like to welcome you to this conference, China's Environment, What Do We Know and How Do We Know It? Normally, when I speak in Berkeley, I jo jokingly apologize for the typically gorgeous weather. And uh, I want to thank those of you who are responsible for, responsible for, uh, for bringing us the rain yesterday because we've had so much gorgeous weather that we have a water shortage. Unfortunately, it looks like we have another gorgeous day today, and we have to be indoors. I want to first say a few words about the Berkeley China Initiative and then share our thinking behind this conference. BCI, the Berkeley China Initiative, was established two years ago in the words of our mission statement, quote, to strengthen research and teaching about China across all disciplines and professions, forge new international partnerships, and enrich public life by communicating these results, unquote. At Berkeley, we have identified approximately 80 faculty members and 200 graduate students who conduct research on some aspect of China. In addition to that, the Bay Area is a repository of unmatched practical experience with China, be it law, media, consulting, trade, investment, banking, nonprofits, the arts, family ties, etc. Through programs such as this one, BCI strives to bring together colleagues from across the campus who might normally not even know of each other, to say nothing of meeting on a regular basis, and also involve people from the community to explore issues related to China in fresh and exciting ways, as well as to attract financial support for this effort. This symposium is one of a series of three conferences on the theme of the production of knowledge about China, funded by the Luce Foundation. Early in BCI's existence, Luce acknowledged our vision of bridging disciplines, as well as deeply linking the campus and community, and they invited us to apply for support. We want to express our very sincere thanks to the Luce Foundation for its generous assistance as well as its affirmation of our vision for the study of China. In thinking about topics for our first conference, we quickly settled on something related to the environment. Given Berkeley's truly exceptional talent across campus and at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab on different aspects of China's environment and energy. Last year, with the School of Journalism under Dean Orville Schell, and Beijing University's College of Environmental Science under Dean C.S. Zhang, we convened a major China-U.S. climate change forum. So this builds on some of the results of that. China's environment has become an issue of global importance. Although the Chinese leadership frequently emphasizes China's sovereignty and opposes foreign interference in its internal affairs, when it comes to the environment, the internal is external. Both China's neighbors and now much of the rest of the world are deeply impacted by the severe environmental degradation within China, as well as the country's relentless global quest for energy and raw materials. It is essential that the Chinese authorities, as well as the rest of the world, have accurate data about what is happening as regards the environment both within the country, as well as wherever China is active abroad. In China, one often hears the expression, there are policies from above and counter policies from below, indicating that not only do local officials often scheme not to implement policies sent down from above, but they also do not report accurate data to the center. The implication for policies and for human life itself is obvious and dangerous. Although some people abroad still label the Chinese state as totalitarian, this is very far from the truth. One often wonders how much Beijing knows about what is going on at the grassroots, to say nothing of having its often very enlightened orders carried out as intended. To explore this very fundamental issue of data in more depth, we have assembled an international lineup of experts from many different areas of ex expertise to share with us not only some of their empirical findings, but also to reflect on the collection, verification,
dissemination, and utilization of data related, related to the environment. We have attempted to put together panels of people who might not ordinarily meet each other in the normal course of events in order to stress the fact that China's environment is embedded in a social, cultural, and historical context that needs to be understood along with the science and engineering aspects. I acknowledge that there are many gaps in the program and many experts who are not here. For instance, we lost some potential participants to the climate change conference in Bali. And the China group of the San Francisco Environmental Protection Agency is in Beijing for a conference. But the response to our invitations was so overwhelmingly positive that like most of us at this season of the year, the panels are overstuffed. We had to stop inviting people. We're going to enforce a rather draconian time limit on presentations to ensure at least some time for interactions. Our objective has been to ask panelists to make brief presentations to stimulate discussion among themselves and with the audience, which also includes many very well-informed and experienced members. The moderators are encouraged to be ruthless in time management. Our four keynote speakers will have more time to share their experiences and thoughts with us and also engage in Q&A. Coffee and meal breaks and tomorrow's closing reception will offer plenty of opportunities for Guanxi work. We can hardly cover everything in these two days and hope at a minimum to achieve the Rumsfeldian goal of exposing many of the unknown unknowns, thereby setting an agenda for future research. Within and outside China, there are now numerous meetings on the environment, and we hope that this conference will help to establish or reinforce some of the horizontal linkages across countries and fields of expertise. The matter will be before us for some time, and collaboration is essential. I personally became interested in environmental issues after, <clears throat> after being asked to serve on the board of the San Francisco-based non-governmental organization Pacific Environment, which, with other organizations, has materials on display here. I am still a novice in this field and am rather selfishly looking forward to learning a huge amount over the next two days. I just returned Wednesday after participating in a delegation from the Bay Area Council which signed a memorandum of understanding with the Yangtze River Development Council in Shanghai to establish a $200 million fund to invest in that region. One mantra we heard over and over again from local officials was green tech and sustainable development. Shanghai is hardly representative of China, but it often serves as the cutting edge. So the hope is that business people and experts from the Bay Area with Cal in the lead can have a positive impact in working with the Chinese on addressing issues of the environment, not only for investment purposes, but also for achievements in medicine, public health, and basic science. The, the proceedings of these two days will be webcast and available on the BCI website uh, for perpetuity. Before inviting Executive Vice Chancellor George Breslauer to make some welcoming remarks, I would like to thank Graham Bullock for his help in formulating questions for the conference. Colleagues too numerous to name at Cal and beyond uh, to name individually for suggesting speakers and helping me make contacts. To the Institute of East Asian Studies and the Center for Chinese Studies for additional funding. To Shannon May for her logistical support. Daniel Colta who is serving as rapporteur. And most especially Hilary Fincham Sung for her, her Herculean and very successful efforts at pulling all this together and not killing me yet. Now please join me in welcoming Vice Chancellor Breslauer. Well, I'm very, I'm very pleased to be here today and to, to welcome all of you to the Berkeley campus and to this conference. Uh, I bring you greetings from Chancellor Robert Bergenau. Uh, I bring his and my own uh, salute to the Berkeley China Initiative for hosting this important conference. Obviously, the topic is of world historical importance, uh, given the rapid growth of the Chinese economy in the past few decades and the growing salience in the past few years 
of the impact that, that growth has been having on both China's environment and uh, global uh, climate issues and global environmental concerns. Of course, China is not the only country that is contributing to this. Uh, the United States, India, and uh, others uh, are going to have a major impact as well. And it would seem to, to me at least, as a political scientist, that, uh, uh, that we're going to have to tackle this problem in many places in the world, including our own country here, uh, and from many different angles. Uh, but Berkeley is the kind of institution, higher educational institution, that has such large numbers of qualified uh, students and scholars, faculty, staff, who uh, collectively uh, bring to bear expertise on so many different issues of world importance that uh, Berkeley is a natural place for uh, this kind of a conference to take place and a natural place to locate many other conferences on complementary topics uh, as well. Uh, our campus is one of the leaders in the area of environmental concerns. Faculty in many departments, ranging from the social sciences to public health, engineering, the biosciences, and many others, are directly engaged in research related to China's environmental crisis, but also to the larger theoretical concerns about how one goes about galvanizing collective action to tackle these kinds of crises that affect many countries at once. I'm very happy to welcome to Berkeley today the many leading academics and representatives of business and non-governmental organizations that have been at the forefront of doing research and educating the public about these topics. I'd also like to express my gratitude and the gratitude of Chancellor Bergino for the generous support for this conference from the Luce Foundation and for its continuing support for work on the production of new knowledge about China. And I'd also like to thank Tom Gold, director of the Berkeley China Initiative, for his efforts in bringing this extraordinary group of scholars and practitioners together. Uh, I always feel self-conscious when I give these kinds of welcoming remarks because the nature of my job is I can never stay for the good stuff. Uh, I give the welcoming remarks and then I have to move on to a meeting. And so I apologize for that fact, but at least uh, I'm glad that I was able to, uh, to be here for a few minutes welcome you and honor your very important work. I wish you the best for these two days. Thank you. Well, I'm very pleased uh, <clears throat> now <clears throat> to introduce our first keynote speaker, Barbara Finnamore. Barbara is the National Resource Defense Council senior attorney and founder and director of NRDC's China Clean Energy Program. She has had over two decades of experience in environmental law and policy in the United States, China, Russia, and Taiwan. She began working for NRDC in 1981 as a staff attorney in its nuclear program and later consulted for NRDC in Moscow. In 1983, she won a landmark case against the U.S. Department of Energy requiring all U.S. nuclear weapons facilities to comply with federal and state environmental laws, which has led to the largest environmental cleanup program in U.S. history. From 1990 to 93, Ms. Finnamore lived in Beijing, where she worked as an environmental consultant to the United Nations Development Program. She's also worked to enforce U.S. environmental laws as a litigator for the U.S. Department of Justice and an attorney advisor to the U.S. Department of the Interior. She's chairman and past president of the Professional Association for China's Environment, PACE, and is vice chair of the International Environmental Law Committee of the American Bar Association Section on Environment, Energy, and Resources. Ms. Finnamore received her law degree from Harvard Law School in 1980 and a Wasserstein Public Interest Fellowship from Harvard Law School in 1993. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Finnamore. Thank you so much, Tom, both for that lovely introduction and also for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event. Um, and 
I'm just delighted to be here with all of you, uh, both the incredible panels of distinguished experts that we have speaking, but also in the audience, so much expertise um, in, in every possible discipline. And I think that is, in fact, one of the strengths of this conference, its ability to bring people together from different areas. And I think actually that's one of the uh, solutions to some of the challenges and, uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. I've been uh, asked to speak not just about the research that I'm doing for the Natural Resources Defense Council, but also some kind of to illustrate the challenges and the opportunities for the international community for all of you through some of my personal experiences. So let me start with that and then I will uh, move on to some kind of broader explanation of my, of my thoughts on what the challenges and opportunities are. Uh, and believe me, there are many of both. Uh, and I come at this from, uh, uh, I say, rather unusual perspective as an environmental litigator. Um, and the situation for me before I moved to China or other countries was very, very different from what I'm facing now, what you're all facing now. In fact, it couldn't have been a better situation for the collection of data and for doing research because litigators have, I think, some of the most powerful tools to hopefully get at the truth, and if not, their version of it. Uh, and so NRDC has made very good use of those. For example, a lot of our litigation relies upon reports, reports of emissions that US companies are, are required to prepare and submit on a regular basis and which are open to the public. Uh, we had many, many clean water suits just one before we even started because the company's own reports of their emissions indicated that they were violating their permits. Um, when, they, when we didn't have that, we had the Freedom of Information Act. Um, if, if information was not readily available to the public, it was supposed to be available to the public. And if it wasn't, we, had to, we could litigate about that as to why we weren't able to get the information that we wanted. Uh, and then when we went to court, we had depositions. We could ask, we had um, information requests. Our, our, the companies we were suing, for example, were required to give us even more information. And then, of course, is the uh, most powerful tool, cross-examination, which I always loved. <laughs> Can you imagine having those tools available in China or other countries? Uh, it's, and, and even though my main target in those years was probably the most secretive government um, uh, organization in the U.S., the what, department in DOE that was in charge of the nuclear weapons complex. And this is an organization in which even the existence of whole cities when they first were built was kept secret. Um, we had another tool, which was whistleblowers. Um, and so the case that you heard about now came about because we had a worker at one of those facilities come and tell us about the incredible levels of toxic mercury that were just being poured into the stream without telling anybody, and they were fishing in it. These are all tools I wish I had now. None of us do, although we work very closely with the Center for Legal Assistance to pollution victims to, uh, who's trying to do something similar in China. Um, but without those, it has been a real challenge for me um, to try to get the information that I need to do our, our work in China. But I have to say, it's not as bad as it was for me when I first moved overseas, which was to the Soviet Union uh, 20 years ago. Um, and this was a, a city, Moscow was a city of that day, at that time, that not only didn't have a phone book, but the maps were deliberately wrong. <laughs> okay, and so, I was asked to do a project there for NRDC, and this of course was before the internet and before even fax machines, and I, uh, <laughs> I had access to a phone for 10 minutes once every week. But I was still working for NRDC there, and uh, I was asked to do some research on uh, nuclear winter. You remember with all our concern now about global warming, nuclear winter <laughs> was an issue then, and I was asked to uh, try to find some of the key researchers in the Soviet Union who'd worked on it and talk to them about their research. Well, how am I going to find these people? It was just 
needle in a haystack, nearly impossible, until one day I was walking down the street with my baby in a baby carriage and I saw the name of the institute where they worked over the door. So being a good advocate and being rather desperate, I, I walked in <laughs> to one of the most secretive agencies in, in, in the Soviet Union and asked for these fellows. And the, everybody in that institute came out to the lobby and stared at me, <laughs> including those two researchers. And I had a chance to talk with them. But I never saw them again after that, even though we promised to keep in touch. And I think that was the beginning of my file, which probably was a foot long and grows to this day. So despite the challenges uh, you all face and we face in China, I think it, it, it's not as bad as you may think. Um, but really, I would have to say, uh, when the challenges, um, if you look at what, um, how to categorize them, I would put them into three categories. One, is the information actually uh, in existence? And I'll give you some examples, many examples, I think you're all uh, familiar with where the, uh, the, the information just has never been collected. Uh, things that are freely available and regularly available in elsewhere. It's just nobody's ever looked into it. This has happened too many times. Uh, number two, can you find it? Can you find the information? Do you know who's collected if the information has been collected? Who's collected that information? How do you find out? And there's you know, built-in uh, disincentives for people to, to, uh, uh, to tell you that. Although with the information, with the internet, I think that's, that's helped quite a bit. And by that, I include you in the room. People, all of you are doing your research. How do we all keep in touch with each other to know who is doing path-breaking work that might be of use, especially when you look at different disciplines? And, and thirdly, are people going to be willing to share it with you if it is available? And, uh, and that ranges so the uh, barriers to sharing the information that is available are, are actually not that different in uh, China than in other countries, though they may be steeper barriers. Um, and they range from things like certain government agencies uh, don't want to, you know, information is power. So people who have the information don't necessarily want to share it with other government agencies, um, uh, except for pay which has always been a problem for a non-government organization like that, or they, want, they don't want to give up their uh, uh, turf, their um, uh, regulatory power, for example, by sharing information with others who might then use it to grab some of their por portfolio. Uh, but it also, as a foreigner uh, trying to work in China, there's always been, although I think that's changing, barriers to sharing information with foreigners. And I'll give you uh, uh, one example of that. Uh, when, I first began, well, when I first began working for NRDC in China, um, we chose energy as our, as our area from the very start, energy efficiency in particular. And the reason we did uh, was th several fold. Uh, first, it's an area where we had a lot of expertise in the United States. We have some of the leading experts on efficiency right here in San Francisco. They have spent 35 years trying to get the national government and the central, not the central government, the national government and the state governments in California and elsewhere to pass path-breaking energy efficiency policies, whether it be mandatory building codes, standards, uh, voluntary uh, green building standards, for example, and, and financial incentives um, to go beyond what's required by minimum codes. And these are the types of programs that we are carrying on in China because we find they work um, and because we have the expertise to share them. So one of the first projects we did was in Chongqing. We decided Chongqing had just become an independent provincial level uh, government, so it would be open to dealing with us and we went there, and um, it took a while for them to understand what a non-government organization was. But once we got over that, uh, they agreed to work with us on developing China's first energy efficiency building code for residential buildings, which was rather pathbreaking to have it happen in, in, um, in Chongqing, of all places. And so we had dealt with them over the phone for a number of times. And then they did a draft and invited us to come and visit. 
uh, bring our team of experts to go over the draft and, uh, and give our comments. And so we did, we assembled a very large team, we made it to Chongqing and uh, went in the room and were told that, sorry, but we really, we really couldn't show you the draft because Chinese government does not make available draft legislation or regulations or codes to foreigners. So we didn't know what to do. So, so we had our legislature enact it yesterday. <laughs> so it was already final. And then we thought, what are we doing here when it's no possibility for any change? We're here to comment on something that's already a done deal. Uh, well, we were there, so we t went over the draft. And uh, so what happened then is they couldn't make changes, but it set in motion a process whereby Chongqing's code then became the model for the regional building code um, for the whole Yangtze River Basin, hot in summer, cold in winter code. And they, they put our comments into play in the next stage. And so then working with, I see my friends from Lawrence Berkeley Lab here, we've partnered together with them for many, many years on a whole series of building codes for China. And now the issue is enforcement of those codes, you know? This is true for so much of what we do. They're on the books, but what do you do to make sure that they're put into, um, put into play? And, and so that's the major focus of our building's work right now, but um, we're having trouble getting information, again, on how the codes are actually, just for example, the first stage, is how are codes actually, how are they being enforced right now? And we had the Vice Minister of Energy of uh, Construction say, only five to 10% of uh, these residential codes are being enforced nationwide. But then um, our colleagues go to Shanghai, and they're, which is probably the best at enforcing codes, and they're told 100% of our codes are being uh, we're enforcing that code in 100% of our new residential buildings. So wh who do you believe? They could possibly both be true, uh, but you always have to think when you're getting information of who the speaker is and what incentives they might have to shade the truth, because they always are. And so a lot of the um, barriers that we have to information comes from the fact that Chinese governments, Chinese at all levels, all organizations, are trying to get funding from groups like mine and from others. Um, and so that will influence what kind of information comes out. Um, but uh, let me go back a little bit. Again, when I first went to China, it was much more serious. I had trouble even getting in the door to talk to people about environmental issues, um, literally. So, my first breakthrough came when I was, again, driving by. This is my, my research method, the drive-by drive approach. I, I was driving down um, uh, uh, Third Ring Road, and I saw a banner in front of one of the hotels announcing a conference for developing countries to prepare for the Rio Conference on Sustainable Development. And Beijing had decided, that was really a breakthrough, had decided that environmental issues and sustainable development were not a plot by the West to keep them from developing, but actually there were substantial benefits for China in adopting that approach and also uh, problems if they didn't. And so I mention that because I see a parallel going on now with climate. Uh, I think you'll, uh, I would assert that China has for many years considered the climate issue also somewhat of a imposition upon them by the West to keep them from developing. And I'm seeing, starting to see changes in the air um, where the, with the development of the China's climate, um, climate change program last July, a recognition of the potentially very serious environmental impacts on China from, from climate change. And therefore, what we're seeing now is a willingness to discuss and consider these issues and to do something about it. So I'm very encouraged by that, though there's a long way to go. And I was very excited to see that Beijing is now going to host a similar conference of developing countries um, next year on climate, trying to take the leadership role of the G77 and so forth. 
But when I saw that banner in those days, I was very excited. So I just, I just went in, and it turned out Lee Pung was speaking. <laughs> and uh, the security, as you can imagine, this is a year after Tiananmen Square, was intense. So what do you do? I think the kind of, uh, um, you know, um, desperation, out of desperation, you know, breakthroughs are made. So I saw somebody else walking in, and I walked next to him, pretended I was there with him, and uh, I don't think he belonged there either, but somehow <laughs> both Westerners, uh, no Westerners were invited, but somehow we managed to, to sneak in, and, and once I got there, I was afraid to leave, you know, for the entire conference because I'd never, never get back in. But uh, that led to a meeting with the head of the UN Development Program in Beijing, and so I ended up working for them during my first three years in China. And on the issue of, of information, I remember that one of the projects I was asked to do was to do a feasibility study on the possibility of developing a sustainable development network, an online web uh, portal for sharing of information among government agencies um, and others on environmental issues. And interestingly enough, this was at the kind of dawn of the internet, and interestingly enough, I remember now that my conclusion was, no, it's probably not feasible because government agencies who had all the information in those days will never share with each other. You know, I was working on this Agenda 21 process, which was an eye-opener, because the, the, the government organizations that were taking the lead on this, which was what? Uh, State Planning Commission then, I think, was the lead one. They would not even let SIPA, which wasn't even a, an agency then, into the room to discuss environmental issues. And I thought, this is hopeless. This is hopeless. There'll never be an opportunity for open information in China. And now it's changed quite a bit. So I am happy to say, I think, these days, uh, the first issue, I think the issue of sharing, at least, is less um, onerous than it was before. But I am very interested in listening to all of you to see what your experiences have been. I think um, <laughs> sometimes now the problem is there's too much information and it's also changing so fast. You know, whenever I give a presentation on energy, I have to go back and look at all of my data because whatever I said last time has changed. So I'm sure you all face that. So it's almost too much data and you try to do research and you have to look at the date of everybody's information because it's gonna go out of, out of date so fast. Um, but the issue I have now is on the energy efficiency side, I'm actually here with a delegation of 20 Chinese officials who are here to learn um, about energy efficiency policies in, in California uh, that have enabled California to keep its per capita energy use flat for over 30 years while continuing to grow its economy, while the rest of the United States per capita energy use has grown by 50%. They want to know what the situation is here and how they can enact those policies. But that wasn't, over the, only the, that wasn't always the case. In, we began talking about energy efficiency. I know uh, Berkeley Lab's been doing it even longer, but it's been 10 years in one province. Uh, trying to say that this was important and trying to bring people to the states and we'll pay for you and uh, can we show you some information, getting nowhere. And so what we did really to kind of break the ice was a very detailed study of what is the actual potential for energy efficiency in one province, the province of Jiangsu, thinking that if we could show them how much power they could save, they might enact the policy. So it's a little bit of a bottom-up approach and so we brought in some experts who have done this all around the United States, and there the problem of getting information was very, very hard. Uh, because, again, it was the first problem. The data had never been collected. We were trying to find out how much energy is being used. Uh, they, they knew very well how much electricity they are producing or buying. Um, but how it's being used, nobody seemed to know. Uh, how much is being used maybe by particular sectors, even though the way they, just, they uh, broke down the sectors was different. 
So we had to do that little bit of calculation. But uh, So maybe they could tell you how much is being used in the residential sector, but for what? What types of appliances? What types of equipment? How much is being used for heating and cooling? The people um, we spoke to anyway, and there may have been others who had the information, we couldn't find it, but the people we spoke to at the um, utilities had no idea. So that continues. To me, the issue of is the information being collected is, continues to be an issue. A lot of it is because there's no metering. So it costs uh, money to inst install the technologies. And that's changing, but it's changing slowly. But that, to me, is still our greatest challenge of um, trying to find information where it really has never been collected. And um, I'll give you a couple other examples. Our public health department is involved in a global initiative to try to reduce the amount of mercury that's used in commerce, that's bought and sold, not the mercury that's being emitted from the power plants. And they quickly realized that China was the largest purchaser of mercury in the world. Um, and so my team went to China to find out where is that mercury being used and can we help uh, with suggestions on developing alternatives to, uh, to equipment, to goods, to pro uh, industrial processes that do not use this toxic mercury. And, and we found, of course, that nobody knew where the mercury was going. So, and this is an opportunity, we decided to work with uh, the SEPA Research Institute who had a chemical registration center who had authority over this to work with them to do an inventory. And they were delighted. So I think one of the solutions here that we use is if the, if the information is not out there, well, we'll work with you to collect it. Um, and so we've been working on this inventory, but then you run into problems because a lot of the mercury that's coming in and out of the country is doing so illegally. And so even though we could get some, we went out and gathered information from the official sources, but it, take, it doesn't take account of the vast uh, numbers of information, uh, numbers of uh, uh, mercury that, that's coming in th through Hong Kong um, illegally. So we're still struggling with that. Um, but I think we made some, some great progress. In fact, we uncovered a use of mercury in uh, polyvinyl chloride plants um, in China, that's, that's probably the second biggest use uh, after batteries that is actually nobody in the international mercury community knew about. And that's because no other country uses mercury to produce polyvinyl chloride because it's used, it's the, the feedstock is coal. And um, everybody else uses oil. But China is not going to switch to oil because of energy security purposes. So we're, um, <laughs> we're now tackling the, the question of how, what alternatives are there, and, it, and, it's, quite, and it's quite difficult. Um, just one more example, we had a project with the Energy Foundation who supports everything we do in, here in San Francisco um, a few years back to develop or propose, advocate for a new way of regulating emissions of sulfur dioxide from power plants. Um, that really was based on how efficient they were. So it was regulation per unit of energy produced rather than per unit of uh, input. So output-based regulation has a lot of advantages because it rewards the plants that produce energy more efficiently. Um, and so we did four pilot projects with SEPA in four provinces that they selected and went to talk to the uh, provincial uh, CEPA, the EPBs about um, getting the data about how much emissions was actually coming out of their province of sulfur dioxide. And while they had good information, though not the best, on uh, the large emitters, they had no information about all the small power plants in their province at all. Uh, and even the information about the large emitters was not based on um, continuous emission monitors that we have in this country, or monitors at all, it was based on an estimate of how much coal they used, and um, which they had good data on. But you have to do an estimate, and you know if there's any pollution control equipment on there at all, it's not going to be a valid estimate. 
Well, I hope that our efforts made a difference in realizing that there was a rather big gap in their information, but I'm not sure whether, whether it did. But uh, at least one province right now is moving ahead with that form of regulation. So um, in closing, I think the opportunities here uh, lie in events like this one, frankly. I mean, we're all moving ahead as quickly as we can to keep abreast of this changing, rapidly changing situation in China. I'm sure that would be true for me to say about all of the disciplines represented here today. I would love to see more formal mechanisms set up. I mean, we have the internet, uh, but more formal mechanisms set up, maybe through the Berkeley China Initiative, for sharing information on issues that may be tangential but turn out to be very, very important if we're going to uh, help China attack environmental issues in a, in a systematic and sustainable way. Um, one of the things I've done to try to help this process along is to set up another NGO that's based here in San Francisco called the China-US Energy Efficiency Alliance. I have some materials on the back table. And this is hopefully going to become a true alliance of all the stakeholders on both in both China and the US who are involved in this particular issue, um, energy efficiency. And that includes, I think, not just nonprofits like mine, but researchers and uh, government agencies, international donors, and most importantly, the business community. Because one of the issues we've come across when we try to propose energy efficiency policies is, well, is the technology there and is it being produced in China itself, or are they going to have to import technology at a very high cost in order to meet the standards that we're proposing? But it's been also very difficult for us to get information on what the market availability is and what the plans are of the private sector to make such technologies available. So just as one example, I'm hoping that this China-US Energy Efficiency Alliance, through, we're going to have and we have been having monthly calls of everybody who's interested in this issue to share information on their research on who they're working with uh, that might have information useful to somebody else. I think that's one model I want to propose to you today uh, because I think, again, the information, the expertise that we have, we all have contacts in China. We don't know who they are. I think joint efforts like this is going to go a large way as we move forward towards overcoming the many challenges that we all face. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank, you. thank you, Barbara. That was absolutely a spectacular way to get this conference uh, underway. <clears throat> I know uh, in my academic role, I feel I have to comment on everything, but I just wanted to make, I'm so stimulated, I wanted to make a few uh, remarks about uh, some of the things you said before we open it up. We'll have about 15 minutes for questioning. I think one of the things that is so central that you raised is the fact that this is that how rapidly things are change, have changed and how they continue to change. And it, things are changing in terms of, uh, in particular, the Chinese official attitude towards issues uh, related to the environment and to climate change. And um, uh, both at the central, especially at the central level, and one of the issues we, you've talked about <clears throat> that I raised as well is getting this attitude change to occur at the local level uh, in terms of implementing these often enlightened and progressive policies. The reality itself continues to change. Uh, the ability to collect verifiable data has changed. Um, what can be publicized, <clears throat> what is not regarded as a state secret can change. And the attitude towards working with foreigners, both government organizations, private companies, and NGOs has also changed. So I think that this is really, uh, many of us carry around an attitude about what's the reality in China as regards any topic, but the environmental issue in particular. And I think that one of the things that has been stressed in, in this presentation is how this is a constantly developing and moving, moving target. A uh, part of China's atti uh, changing attitude is its learning the role of being a responsible stakeholder in global affairs, as it was called by, by Robert Zellick. And I think being a responsible stakeholder is not just a question of security and aid uh, and investment, but also paying attention to issues of the environment 
and of climate change. So I, I don't want to dominate the discussion, uh, but I want to certainly open it up. I'll, I'll call on people. Uh, Barbara will take, take your comments or questions. And whereas the, Eleanor has the, room, has the microphone in the back, because we are taping uh, for uh, a webcast. So if you have a question, please stand up, raise your hand, stand up, and then wait till Eleanor brings you the, the microphone uh, before speaking. Yes, uh, Professor John over here. Barbara, thank you very much for an exciting speech. And I wonder if you can uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on the key uh, limitations to environmental litigation in China, and uh, uh, particularly you know, from your work in NRDC, China, US, and other countries. See, uh, you know, what would be your advice you know, for, for uh, getting those uh, key limitations? You know, relax a little bit. Well, wow. that's a very good question. Um, just, I'll be brief. Uh, I thought it was difficult to, to litigate in the United States on environmental issues, but it is so much more difficult in China for those lawyers who are taking that on for a variety of reasons, uh, both politically um, uh, and also just the, the actual practical barriers to bring the lawsuit are, are quite large and, and sometimes seem to be growing. I mean, basically, they stem from just coming to up with the fee that's required to bring a lawsuit. And I've heard cases where, um, uh, you know, class action suits have cobbled together, all these poor, you know, um, victims have cobbled together the fee only to find the fee has been doubled just before they can even get started. Um, uh, you know, getting the court to, to even recognize your case uh, and I read this in the New York Times, if Jim Yardley is here, you probably wrote it, uh, where uh, some victims have had trouble getting the papers that they want to file into the hands of the, uh, of the court because it, once that happens, they have to respond. If they decline the case, that can be appealed. Um, so they don't even want to touch it. Um, but even more, there's been some regulations lately limiting class action suits to those that have been approved uh, by the government. And I thought if NRDC had to get approval for every case that we brought, which is often against the government, uh, we would never be here today. And, and again, that raises another issue of certain types, types of cases are acceptable, but not the ones necessarily against the government itself, though possibly against local governments, but certainly not against the central government. Um, the type of, of relief that you can get is, is, is very restricted. You can get uh, uh, compensation, financial compensation for damage to e your economic health, but not your physical health necessarily, though I think that is changing now. Um, it's hard to get injunctive relief. In other words, the, having the judge order um, somebody to stop the pollution rather than just pay for it. Again, this is all changing, so like everything else you mentioned. Um, and, and enforcing the judgment is, going to, is always difficult. Um, and, and finally, what we're trying to help with is how do you make the case? How do you prove causation? Um, and so we've, we're bringing in teams of lawyers to work with lawyers in, um, in, uh, in China to try to show things, for example, of what types of symptoms are associated with certain types of chemical emissions. Uh, you know, air or water. And so things like that, lack of information, lack of funding. You know, in the U.S. we have uh, laws that allow or require the defendant, if they lose, to pay the court fees of the plaintiff. And that has helped groups like mine uh, bring these suits and so on. I could go on, but that gives you a sense of the tremendous challenges. Thanks. Uh, Professor John? Yeah. Uh, I, I wait, wait, wait. Hold on, Mike. Familiar with the and our DC effort on the making difference of the building code in China. And I think, uh, but uh, did you ever look at yourself when you promote this? Do you have any problem on your side, not only just on the China side? The, because the reputation for NDRC tried to push in the building code very strong. Some of your people over there criticize some other in a proposal for the building code. I don't want to give you a specific person, and I know, and maybe you know who they are, 
and they are pushing very hard and make the Olympic Committee very upset. We want to bring the building code to the green code of the Olympic and pushing very hard and then in the meantime alienate many other countries and many other things. Then they give the impression very bad. Seems like Americans come over here again. Let me tell you what to do. What do you think? Well, you've raised, thank you for saying that. You've raised a really important issue for all of us who are not from China when we go to China to work. And I'm sorry to hear about that incident um, because my approach has always been that our country has severe <laughs> problems of its own. And um, it, especially in the environmental area, especially in the climate area, we don't have, we, you know, especially if we're talking about this administration, we have no moral authority at all. But beyond that, I feel it's so important, and I have tried in all of my dealings um, in China, to have mutual respect for the people that we're dealing with. And I find that goes a long way. I have never um, had the attitude of we're here to tell you what to do. Uh, because we're here to learn, um, and the people that we're dealing with know the situation better than we do. So in general, my attitude has been, okay, here is some, I, uh, here's some best practices, here's some policies, here's some technologies you might want to know about that have worked to varying degrees in other countries. Um, what do you think? You think it might work here? And I think that's the attitude that's... Uh, got to be in place or else we're, nobody would want to talk to us. Coming in and telling you what to do is a, is a dead end. I guess it's a related question. Um, huge successes that we've had in the U.S. and in Europe have been uh, to a great extent driven by civil society. NRDC being a particular great example. Um, and NRDC, I'm sure, contribute to China in this regard, but in the end, China has to do it itself. And I didn't hear anything about capacity building at all. Um, you say working with people, but where is the, the you know, formal capacity building? So China has an NRDC in five years, and you can go on to um, some other place. <laughs> well, that's another great point. Capacity building is essential because no matter, even if the policies were there, um, they cannot be enforced because China lacks capacity in so many areas. Um, it is a key part of what we do. I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier because it wasn't quite on topic, but it is in terms of your questions of how do we actually operate, um, it's, a key, it's a key aspect of, of what we do. When I mentioned the environmental law work, we're not doing any of it itself. It's completely 100% capacity building of the people in China who have to take this on. Um, and, and it, will China have an NRDC in, in five years? We work very closely with many, many NGOs. We actually put up China's first website in Chinese um, on what are people's, what does the law say at the national level? What does the regulation say? What do the laws and regulations say in key provinces on citizens' ability and rights to participate on environmental decision making? Um, and that was for capacity building purposes, so people throughout the country can see this and realize what they can do with it. Um, and on the uh, energy side, like I said before, I've got this delegation of 20 people here. We do exchanges back and forth all the time. But even in the study I told you about energy efficiency potential, that was not just our experts. It was a team of experts from Jiangsu province and from, um, and from our side, we took them every step of the way through this effort. And then the results were so shocking, I think. We found that Jiangsu could save the equivalent of 26 large power plants in 10 years just through inexpensive, easily available measures. Uh, they hired, uh, the Jiangsu team found another group of experts who then spent eight months going over every figure in our um, report. Not just because they didn't believe it, but also because they wanted to learn how to do it. And so every time we do anything in China, it's with a team of Chinese experts that we hope to train so we can go away <laughs> and not have to uh, continue on.